beautiful soul. Have you ever wanted to speak to angels? Do you believe angels can support you in your daily life? If this is you, go to my website homepage, theangelmedium.com and sign up for my weekly angel message email. As a gift for signing up, I'm giving you access to free resources, including 31 healing meditations that, if you do daily, are going to help you hear your angels and your own intuition more clearly. Start using these today and you'll see changes in 31 days. Now, take a deep breath. Feel the presence of your angels as they fill you with love, joy, peace, bliss, and ease. And remember, your angels say the messages that resonate with you in today's episode are meant just for you. Hello, beautiful souls. Welcome back to the Angels and Awakening podcast. I'm your host and author, Julie Jancis. Friends, today we are here with Rain Wilson. You might know him from the show, The Office, um, but he has written a beautiful, poetic, a very deep, deep book on spirituality. It's called Soul Boom. Soul Boom. Why we need a spiritual revolution. And uh, what I want you to know is just that he, well, I'm going to read some of his words because I think that he says it better than I can. So I'm going to read you just a couple of lines from his book, a couple of different parts, because I want you to go into this interview really seeing what I see. I read this book from cover to cover, um, really went through it with a fine tooth comb, and he makes so many brilliant points. In this very first part, he says, and I propose that humanity suffers every day from lack of spirituality, the nourishment that can be found in the ancient wisdom-based writings for the soul. Those achingly beautiful words that stream from the divine source, teachings that have been around in one form or another for a very long time, inspired, holy, wisdom. We desperately need to revolutionize and transform how we approach, consider, and ultimately address everything we human beings do on planet earth. Because the keys necessary to transformational change can be found in the core of spiritual writings, holy texts, and the essential teachings of the various religious faiths throughout history. Do not fear skeptics, atheists, anti-religionists, and agnostics. We don't need to ascribe to a particular religion or faith in order to put these practices to use in individuality or collectively. There is, after all, a significant difference between spirituality and religion. It's why spiritual but not religious is the fastest, largest growing belief system in our country. However, while we don't need religion per se, we do need to be in a humble enough posture of learning to admit the following. As a species, we are quite lost right now. And perhaps the systems, beliefs, practices, and behaviors that society is currently operating in are simply not working. Maybe they are founded on some faulty, unsustainable assumptions. Maybe political parties, international, in government, intergovernmental organizations, and our Washington, D.C. leaders won't fix us. Maybe our existing economic systems, nonprofits, and social movements don't have the answers either. We need another way forward a soul-inspired revolution. So friends, that is what today's interview with Rain is all about. How we are really coming to a point within our world where our 
disease, our biggest disease is a spiritual disease, a lack of spirituality. And the way forward is spirituality, your relationship with God, universe, source. And uh, this is another very, very interesting part that I'm reading to you next from the book. Um, Rain says, Western thought has been manically focused on God as the source of creation, a founder and an instigator. There have been countless debates, discussions, and philosophical treatises in this vein. My friend, the great Baha'i philosopher Stephen Phelps, reminded me that the discussion has unfortunately been far less focused on God as a goal, a destination, a way of life, a rich garden of qualities to emulate, or an energy to both draw for, from and align with. He goes on to say, perhaps we ought to spend less time thinking of this creative force, God, as a what and more like a how. How to live in this world with a radiance, humility, a spirit of service, and a sacred harmony. He goes on to say that all of us should ask ourselves the question, what does God want from me? What do they want from us? Because at the end of the day, it all boils down to what does the great mystery want from me personally? What do they want from us collectively? Surely there must be some kind of plan. I'm telling you, friends, there is just one nugget after another in this book of just these very profound spiritual moments. Uh, another part that I just loved in the book is when he talks about um, and equates love to be action. You know, love is love has to be actionable. He says, if one thing unites all religions, all faiths, it is the universality of the law of love. And as with my point about prayer, we are all called to move our concept of love from beyond a mere feeling in the chest to action. Because isn't that what it's ultimately about? If you love your relations, your country, your planet, you do something to help nurture and support them, right? Mother Teresa sums it up with, love cannot remain by itself. It has no meaning. Love has to be put into action. And that action is service. Around the same area in the book, he quotes a poem that says, I slept and dreamt that life was joy. I awoke and saw that life was service. I acted and behold, service was joy. Friends, I am telling you, there is just one nugget of wisdom after another. And I actually had to read this book more slowly to really digest it and marinate on it because it, you know, there are some books that you can read very quickly. Um, and there are some books that are so dense and thick and just jam packed with amazing details and profound aha moments that it's almost like your being just needs time to sit with them. And, and for me, that that was a lot of this book. Uh, so without further ado, I hope you love this interview. Um, here is Rain Wilson. Hello, beautiful souls. Welcome back to the Angels and Awakening podcast. I'm your host and author, Julie Jancis. And friends, you are not going to believe who we have on the show today. It's the one and only Rain Wilson. You might know him better from Dwight over on The Office and... Rain, thank you just so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. I know we've been trying to connect for a while. I'm so glad that we get to have a conversation. Thanks for having me. me. Too. You've been everywhere. I'm seeing you on all the podcasts, um, on the Drew Barrymore show, on Late Night uh -huh. TV, and you are really spreading this mission of a spiritual revolution. You say that what the world is kind of going through right now, we're at a point of a spiritual disease and really the remedy to this 
is a spiritual revolution. I know the entire book is about this. I'm going to pick out some pieces, but talk to us a little, a little bit about, about this. Yeah, the, um, oh, look, I just happen to have a copy right here. <laughs> Soul Boom, Why We Need a Spiritual Revolution. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the things I talk about early on in the book is this idea that there is a twofold spiritual path and that we in the Western world often think about the spiritual path um, our personal spiritual path as the as the main spiritual path. And in a lot of ways, it is. I compare that to the great 70s television show Kung Fu, which is about, you know, Kwai Chang Kane is a Shaolin monk. And he's, you know, he, he goes to the Old West, but he fights martial arts, but he has all this deep, wonderful Eastern wisdom. And he goes through his life combating racism and, and aggression and trying to make himself a better person and to share his wisdom and whatnot. And that I use as an analogy for our personal spiritual transformation, which is so important. Finding peace and serenity, meditation, prayer, connection. Um, maybe it's yoga or meditation class, being in nature, that, that kind of path. The other one I talk about is, the sh is compared to the show Star Trek, which you may not think at first blush that it's a very spiritual show, but it, it really kind of is because humanity has solved all of its problems in Star Trek. Racism doesn't exist anymore. Income inequality doesn't exist anymore. Men and women are equal. We are loving and working together. And, and because we're unified, we're then able to go out into space and explore strange new life and new civilizations. So um, that's the other part of the spiritual journey, which is taking our uh, first path and then sharing it. And, you know, the Buddha talked a great deal about the elimination of suffering, right? And lots of ways to do that, being in the moment, non-attachment, et cetera. But one of them is service to others. And this idea that we want to reduce, the, because of our compassion for others, we want to reduce the suffering of others. And this, this isn't spoken about quite as much, but this is part of the, the, the mission of the Buddha and, and all of Buddhism is reducing the suffering of others. And that's what a bodhisattva is. A bodhisattva is someone who's achieved nirvana, but chooses to come back down and be of service to humanity. So this to me is the Star Trek path. And this is where, this is the direction of the spiritual revolution that we can use spiritual tools to not only transform ourselves and make ourselves more enlightened, kind, wise, loving, we can then take that spiritual juice and we can put it in service to humanity and rebuild systems and build grassroots movements based on it that makes the world a better place. Absolutely. I think what's fascinating for just like me knowing my audience here is when I was reading the book, um, I kept thinking to myself, if my dad could have written a book in this lifetime, this mm. is the book he would have wanted to write because like yeah. you, he would read all of the different spiritual texts. And I think if my grandma could have read a book. She always wanted to learn about all the world's religions. This sums it up. I mean, you really go through in detail and outline where we've been spiritually within the world, all of the world's religions. You do an excellent job of summing it all up and then showing people where we are and where we need to go. And mm. one of the other kind of aha moments that kind of came out of this for me was when you look at where we are right now today, there are so many different people in, in for the readers who haven't read the book yet, and you should totally grow, go grab it. It's one of the best books that I've read in the last five years. Holy moly. That's a big praise. Thank you. Yeah, I, I absolutely loved it. You really talk about um, that this new religion that the world needs, needs to not have a hierarchy of power. And that kind of like Alcoholics Anonymous, there needs to be local chapters all over. And I kept getting this picture within my mind of all the different people doing that, all the different healers out there, all of the different mm -hmm. spiritual teachers. Is this already happening or do we need something unified, centralized? Uh-huh. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a great question. It really is, Julie. It's um, I don't exactly know how to answer it. And I, I, my book is set up. Soul Boom is set up to ask a whole bunch of questions. And like I say in the beginning, it's throwing a bunch of spiritual spaghetti at the wall, and we'll see what sticks. Uh, I talk about God. I talk about the soul and life after death. I talk about um, the nature of suffering, sacredness, finding sacred and holy spaces in our lives. But then I also talk about social transformation and like how taking spiritual tools and transforming it socially. You know, I am a member of the Baha'i faith, which I brings me a great deal of peace and meaning and purpose. And this is not a Baha'i book by any by any stretch of the imagination, but for me, Baha'i faith allows a framework for personal transformation and social action. And I wanted to have the book, this was a book for everyone. I really wanted atheists and agnostics to be able to appreciate it. People that had a deep spiritual connection to just the miracle and awe and wonder of being alive. Yeah. And then also I've been doing some interviews with like evangelical Christians and people in organ, very organized religions. Um, and, and, and it's been pleasing to see that they've been getting something out of this discussion because that's what it is. So, but yeah, I talk about how change needs to be at the grassroots and it needs to be service-based and real change comes from, I have a section, uh, don't just protest, build something. Yeah. It's easy. We're in a contemporary society that wants to protest injustice at every turn. And that's important. But then we stop there. So don't just protest. It's much harder to build something having to do with community. And I have these tools for a spiritual revolution at the end. And one of them, which you do so well and your audience does so well, is to, is to foster joy and squash cynicism. We have to believe that change is possible. We can, we can change hearts. We can transform hearts with love and service, and we can spread joy around the world. And I, I love that the 12 step idea of like, um, no, you know, no clergy and, and no kind of larger higher hierarchies that we're student in, uh, we're servant, servant leaders, you know, and, I think that's a, a great path to emulate. Yeah. There was one part in your book where you talk about the Baha'i faith and one principle in there that if you're going to do something, reach as many people as you can within the world. And you talk a lot about servitude and how much each one of us is here to serve. And those are two things that I have felt very, very deeply within my being since I can remember as a little girl. Mm -hmm. um, but I had never seen it in any other spiritual text where it said, you know, if you're going to do something, go out and reach as many people as possible. Um, mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about that too. Well, this. This is the Baha'i connection to that Star Trek idea. So I know this is very eclectic. I'm talking about a religion that most people hasn't, haven't heard of and talking about a TV show that was most famous in the 1970s, but that's how my brain works. So forgive me. But yeah, the Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith, says all men have been created to usher forth an ever advancing civilization. So it's part of the reason that we are alive is to help our species mature, grow wise, and progress. Mm -hmm. That's pretty remarkable. Baha'is do this not by converting people to the Baha'i faith, although people are welcome to join, but it's not about that. It's just about doing service. One of the highest forms of worship, in fact, the highest form of worship in the Baha'i faith is service to others. Baha'u'llah says, work in the spirit of service is worship in the eyes of God. So. Our work, your work, having these elevated, beautiful conversations on spiritual topics with a devoted, you know, coterie of listeners is, is an amazing service. And this, from a Baha'i perspective, that is, that is worship. So, of course, one can worship by, by praying and, you know, being involved in, you know, in rituals and, and, you know, finding sacred spaces, communing with people. Um, but, also worship uh, has to do with service to humanity. So we serve humanity. We, tri we try and usher forth an ever advancing civilization. This is that Star Trek path of the spiritual 
uh, the spiritual way that I hope will lead to a spiritual revolution by getting people digging into these uh, spiritual tools that we can uh, put into a practical use. Amazing. I love that. Um, okay. I want to, can I read just a little paragraph from your book? Of course. The okay. narcissist in me is <laughs> applauding you for reading a chunk of my book. Thank you. Yay. Um, okay. So this is the part where you talk about your dad passing and you say that there's this really profound aha moment that you come into when you're mm. looking at his body after he passes and you really realize that that this was just a vessel, that he's no longer in this physical body. And mm. you say, if my previous observation um, is true and we are not just our bodies, and in fact, our consciousness transcends our physical limitations, then what does that mean for how we live our lives until our body's final breath? The first evidence of humanity having some kind of spiritual journey seen in some of the earliest human settlements, more specifically the burial mounds of 30,000 to 1, uh, 100,000 years ago, in almost every single ancient culture around the world, bodies were buried in shallow graves and alongside those bodies were regularly placed items and objects that the deceased individual might need in the afterlife swords, jewelry, pets, canoes, tools. Why? Why would humans from the beginning of time not just toss bodies aside the same way that animals do? It's a hell of a lot easier. Plus, the time, expense, and difficulty. Unless the items weren't seen as being lost for forever and were instead viewed as essential tools for whatever awaited the dead man along the next chapter of his mysterious ongoing journey. Are we wired for a spiritual connection to our lost loved ones? I thought that was like one of the best lines of the book. Like, are we really wired for mm. this spiritual connection? Not just here in the present world, but this is a question that we ask all the time on the show. I think we are meant for that connection with our loved ones who cross over. No question. No question. You know, um, you might make me cry a little bit, but um, my father passed away a couple years ago and we were very, very close. And um, like I said, and, and I'm sure many of the listeners have had the same sensation. When I was preparing the body for burial, and I tell some funny stories about that in the book, just a profound, bone deep realization that this is not my father. This body is not my father. His light, his soul, his energy, his consciousness, his beingness uh, has moved on. And this was the vessel that carried it. It carried it for 79 years. God bless his soul. And it, the reality of who he is has moved on. And one of the, one of the examples I give in the book is of the baby in the womb, you know, the Babies in the womb are, are growing their arms and legs and eyeballs and eardrums and everything it's going to need in this world. But if you went to a baby and said, hey, why do you have arms and legs and ear ball, uh, ear lobes and eyelashes? The baby would be like, I have no idea. I'm happy just <laughs> sitting here in the amniotic sac getting taken care of. I've got my food coming in on this tube and I'm cool. I don't know what all this stuff is for. But of course, we need it in the physical plane right? We are doing the same thing in this physical plane. We're growing our spiritual arms and legs and limbs and eyeballs that we're going to need in the next world. And those are the qualities of the divine, the qualities of divine light. They're mercy and love and kindness and compassion and open-heartedness and creativity. The qualities of God, the qualities of the divine, that those are what we take with us. And that's what my father took with him. And I had no sense that he had been somehow extinguished. And every deep sense in my gut that he had moved on, that he had moved forward. And, um, and I commune with him regularly. You know, I do. I, um, you know, in the Baha'i tradition, of course, we pray to God to, you know, for lack of a better word, God, but the, the great creative spirit of the this universe and infinite other universes beyond time and space, right? 
And I also can commune with my father's spirit. I'm in conversation with him. I'm in connection with him. I feel his presence. I feel his guidance. And that's, that's there because they're, they're on the other side in the same way that we're on the other side for a baby in the womb right? When, when you meet a pregnant friend and you put your hand on their belly and you're right next to them, like we're, we're there for them. We're monitoring them. We're, we're caring for them. We're making sure they're getting the nutrients that they need. And uh, so that's a very important part of my spiritual practice. Yeah. How do you know when your dad's trying to get your attention from the other side? You know, that's, that's a great question. I, to me, it's, uh, it mostly is when I'm in stillness mm -hmm. and I need to calibrate that in my, in my meditation practice. So when I pray and meditate in the morning and I, I do say some, some Baha'i prayers and some other prayers, and then I sit in stillness and then I always leave a little bit of time to just connect with my dad and to just, you know, to ask God to guide, guide his soul to, and to just say, hey, dad, I, I love you. I miss you. And 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 that's when I, I do sometimes. My son was going through a very difficult time about a year ago. And I was really asking my dad for help. Like, please be there as his grandfather from the other side and help him move forward. And and I and I had several times this overwhelming sense of like, it's gonna be okay. Mm -hmm. it, trust me. It may seem really bad right now. It's going to be okay. And you know what? It was okay. And nine months later, my son got out of that time and has, he's doing so much better. And, um, and I truly feel the kind of guidance of my father's spirit through that. So, but you have to stay open. It's receptivity. You know, our hearts are like satellite dishes, you know, attuned to the divine kingdom. And we have to keep them radiating upwards, you know, turned upwards to be open to what comes. Yeah. A hundred percent. I believe that they're guiding us every step of the way. Um, mm -hmm. and they're always feeding us that guidance in different ways and different signs. Mm -hmm. Um, there are a lot of healers who it's spiritual teachers who listen to this show. And I want everybody listening who knows that they're called to serve in a spiritual capacity in some way to know that this book was very, very eye-opening because you go through and you give a couple of different lists about, you know, what the world needs in a spiritual revolution right now. And as I looked at it, I was like, okay, the people who are on top of this working right now are hitting these points, but you could really clearly see in what you outlined like these aha moments were going off in my head. We're not hitting this. We're not hitting this. We need to work better on this. Mm -hmm. um, one of them's community. I think a lot of people are having hard time really pulling in community with a, a broader audience that serves people from across the world. Um, the other one is you talk a lot about how we have these big philosophical thoughts and ideas and spiritual texts, but really bringing them down to earth and grounding them, helping people put them into their everyday lives with practical practices. Mm -hmm. We're missing some of that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. This is a delicate topic, but I feel like we have suffered a great deal of religious trauma uh, culturally. A lot of people, probably listeners, have grown up in the church mostly and had some negative experiences and feel traumatized by it and are long for spirituality and connection, but don't want to definitely do it through an organized religion. That is so many of my friends. And for me, I say that one of the phrases I use is, I've, I feel like I've thrown this, the spiritual baby out with the religious bathwater, that we jettison religion, and then we also have lost a lot of what religion gives us. So some people say, oh, is this a book about people that are spiritual but not religious? And I was like, well, kind of. I hope that those people enjoy the book. And, but I definitely, in some ways, make a case for religion itself because there are aspects of religion 
that are incredibly positive. You know, like you mentioned community, like a group of people coming together in love to something bigger than them. You know, um, I went to a church service recently, a memorial service, and it was so beautiful. The singing together, the rituals, the we're all there to celebrate the soul, the journey of the soul. And, and it was so uplifting. There's a lot that organized religion gives us. So um, I do talk about that, that we're quick to kind of be like, ugh, I, I don't, can't be a part of organized religion. And, and I get that, but we've lost some stuff, uh, communal service that if we're not going to get it from an organized religion, then we can get it in other ways. But these are important for our mental health and they're important for our social health. Absolutely. A hundred percent. One of the other things that you talk about that I think maybe is missing too is radical compassion. Mm. Mm-hmm. Radical yeah. compassion. We we want to be compassionate and yet something happens to us and then we're very easy to just kind of snap back to our old ways. Yeah. Yeah. I talk about um, this. I have a little science fiction diversion in that chapter where I talk about what if we could build a compassion machine where you go inside this MRI machine with a brain scan or whatever and it put you in the skin, in the shoes, behind the eyeballs of someone totally, totally different than you. And you lived your life in their shoes for a period of time. It could be a Pakistani fisherman or a Mongol shepherd or someone in the bush in Africa or someone, you know, a, an immigrant in, in Central America. And where you would deeply deeply then feel for these different people now if you were if you you imagine if you children and you had them like every week undergoing this like you would really understand what it's like to be someone very very different than you and i use that as a just a kind of a science fiction jumping off point to 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 be like can we do that in our lives can we really practice radical compassion that's what jesus did that's what the buddha did that's what all the great spiritual teachers did and radical I, compassion. Yeah. I actually believe that that's what happens when we pass. I believe that part of yes. us goes for a life review and our life review isn't like watching our lives on a big movie screen from the audience. We're, we're in, we're in other people's shoes. We're living out our actions in the people that we impacted in their yeah. skin. I, I think so. And I think one of our biggest regrets will be when we pass is all the resentments that we had and the people we weren't speaking to and the people we had iced out of our lives and we're living in kind of like, you know, grumbly resentment of, that's just going to be instantly healed because we can see them for who they are, their failings, our failings. We're all so fragile. Our, de- our egos are so delicate and we'll have an incredible vision. Um, uh, that will allow that kind of radical compassion uh, on the other side. I I agree. Yeah. Um, okay. You also have this story in the book about your pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And mm-hmm. you talk in great length. Um, one of the parts I found so interesting was how much the different religious leaders bickered over there, even within the same church, which is not <laughs> uncommon because I talked to a person who worked in the UN one time, and she said, mm-hmm. they're the ones when they come into the UN, the religious leaders are always the ones that bicker the most between one another. Um, But I love the story that you tell when you're coming home, you're at home for a couple of weeks, you're in the car in LA and you just have this moment of how was I so peaceful there and I'm not feeling that here and I need to hone in on this sacred space within myself. Everyone needs a place within themselves to come home to a sacred space within. Yeah. So I went on a pilgrimage to the the Holy land and it was really life changing. And if anyone hasn't been to Jerusalem, it's, it's a powerful place. And just the fact that there's billions of people that hold it as the most sacred spot. And it's fascinating to see that 
the conflux of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam coming together over just a couple hundred square yards. Really, you're talking about the Temple Mount. And uh, yeah, the the bickering, the history, the um, uh, the disunity is is tragic. But I also got to witness these holy sites like the Wailing Wall, like the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and then in the Baha'i tradition, the Baha'i Holy Land in the north of Israel in, in Haifa, and um, visiting holy spots, praying there, being in that sacred, holy, sacrosanct condition of mind and heart, and then coming home, and then I've got emails and texts and Zoom meetings and and everything like that is um, uh, really uh, challenging. And and I don't have any answers around this, Julie. You might more, but how do we find sacred spaces, sacred acts, holy places, holy ways of being in the world, in our daily life, so that we can bring the, that sense? You know, the the Diné people, the Navajo people, have this prayer about you know walk in beauty and the. the it's a, it's a prayer that they say every day. I walk in beauty. I hope to walk in beauty. May you walk in beauty. And um, we don't walk in beauty in contemporary culture. And what would that be like to walk in beauty? Because that's that's sacredness. It is. It is. Um, and I hope that's something that we do answer throughout this podcast. Um, I know we're running out of time here. I got two really quick questions. I'm just going to okay. ask them both. Um, one, my daughter is in kind of acting. She loves the plays in schools. Any yeah. um, tips, tricks for young actors out there, a young theater folk? Um, and second, you have gotten to interview with some great spiritual minds of our time, Russell Brand, Jay Shetty, um, tons of people lately. I'm wondering if there's anything that you've had in those conversations where you're like, wow, it, that's either good for the next book, or I wish I would have put that in the book. Uh, <laughs> well, it's so funny when you're writing a book, um, I was finishing the book on deadline and I had to finish the last chapter. And I was like, why the hell did I sign up to write a book? I'm never doing this again. Oh my God. It's so hard. Writing books is so hard. Um, and of course now I'm like, hmm, what's my next book? <laughs> I've learned so much from so many people along this conversation. Um, I just, it hasn't aired yet, but I did a, interview with Dan Harris, who has the 10% Happier podcast, which is yeah. a very popular podcast on happiness. And he's been doing a deep dive into Buddhism, some episodes that are, are just, I've found really transporting. I'm, I'm very close to Buddhism and, and Buddhist thought. I don't have anything specific right now, um, but you know, I'm intrigued by the meaning of life. You know, um, it's, the biggest possible questions. I like going for the biggest ones. I love and as it. far as acting, you know, I'm a big believer in training. I'm, uh, there's kind of this American thing of like, Brad Pitt takes a bus from Oklahoma and shows up at the Greyhound <laughs> station and he's got his suitcase and he's a movie star and he's happens to be brilliant. But I'm a big believer in getting theater training and finding the very best teachers and going to the best schools and just spending those 10,000 hours working on what it means to use text and to move your body and to tell stories and to be doing it with other like-minded people and getting all of that time so that you can have a rich, long career as an actor. So mm -hmm. I would say get, get the very best training. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rain. And everybody watching out there, um, you have to get Rain's new book, Soul Boom. You are going to love it. You learn so much about world like religions, just a really great overview of where we're at within the world. And if you're a healer, this is a must read because it is going to give you so much insight into where God is calling you to help and serve humanity in different ways. Rain, thank you so much for the work that you're putting out into the world. Um, is there any last place that you want people to share where they can reach you? Well, I'm on the old social media, but uh, certainly, but I also want to just put in a plug, Julie, for a new TV show that's coming out um, May 18th called uh, The Geography of Bliss, 
where I travel the world looking for happiness. And it's a really uplifting travel documentary show. I go to Iceland and Africa and Thailand and, um, uh, and have a lot of fun along the way. And I think your listeners would really love it. It brings a lot of joy and hope uh, to the viewer. And it's, it's a lot of fun. That's incredible. We'll have them watch that and we'll put all of that in the show notes below. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Julie. Bye-bye. Bye. Beautiful soul, thank you so much for joining me today. My name's Julie. You know I'm all about connecting you with messages from your angels and loved ones on the other side. If you've been listening today and you're super excited and just have to know which angels are around you right now, who's connecting with you, and what messages they have for you, go to theangelmedium.com. Register for a session. You can do a reading with me or a member of my team, and we can help you in making sure that your angels are doing the very best they can to support you and guide you to your best life. If this sounds like you, virtual sessions, they're only offered on my website. Sign up today. And if you're the person who's really excited, you can sign up for my Angel Reiki School to become a certified angel messenger. That's for the healers among us who feel called to grow their intuition to the max and serve humanity with their gifts. You'll learn Reiki, mediumship, how to deliver angel messages, and how to get clients. That's the Angel Reiki School at theangelmedium.com or DM me on Instagram at Angel Podcast with any questions. Before you go, connect with your angels by placing your hands on your heart. Take a deep breath. Imagine a doorway filled with God's unconditional love is right in front of you. Step into that love and feel it as it fills your body, chakras, and auric field. Now ask your angels, what would you have me know today? And open yourself to the positive, loving messages they have just for you. <laughs>